My name is Ed Kessler. Uh, I'm director uh, of the Wolf Institute, and it's my pleasure to, uh, to welcome you here. Uh, the Wolf Institute is dedicated to the study of relations between Jews, Christians, and Muslims, um, and uh, for the purpose of enhancing public life, really, in the public good. Uh, this lecture um, is also uh, in memory of Melanie Wright. Uh, Mel was our first academic director, uh, who tragically uh, died of cancer. Um, but without her uh, energy and commitment to the study of Jewish-Christian relations, the postgraduate programs that we have here, most importantly, the Masters, the Cambridge University Masters degree in the study of Jewish-Christian relations would not be uh, running as successfully uh, as they are. <coughs> Uh, I'm going to hand over to the Vice-Chancellor in a moment, uh, but I'd just like to give you um, a little bit of background to how we've got to this moment where uh, the Archbishop of Westminster is delivering this lecture on uh, Jewish-Christian relations. And actually, um, the idea uh, to invite you came about from the Pope's visit, Pope Benedict XVI's visit to this country in September 2010, uh, where there was a meeting uh, of, um, I think it was called Non-Christian Faith Leaders, I think was the official title, um, where a group of us uh, met with um, the Holy Father, um, and the chief rabbi at that moment, because he introduced the Pope, said there was a real meeting of souls, not just a meeting of minds. Uh, and he said, would it be possible uh, to have a longer conversation uh, with, with the Pope? And about 14 months later, because that's how long it takes, uh, we, uh, we visited him uh, in Rome uh, and had a very serious reflection uh, on the state of relations, not just amongst Jews and Christians, but you know, in the turmoil of Europe, dealing with issues such as morality and the markets and issues of trust and faith. And it was a real meeting of minds which has resulted in a serious <coughs> engagement between the Gregorian University and, and the Wolf Institute. And that meeting, uh, bringing together academic study and a practical <coughs> outcome and impact, if you like, uh, makes it particularly important that you're here, Archbishop, and I think also that the Vice-Chancellor has generously agreed to chair this lecture because it's the academic excellence and the impact that I believe this university stands for. Vice-Chancellor, thank you. Well, thank you very much indeed uh, for that, and it's a real privilege to be here tonight and to welcome Archbishop Nichols and all of you, ladies and gentlemen, to, uh, to, to the lecture tonight. Uh, from my perspective, it's well known that in university circles, academic disciplines kind of form, coalesce, start by a process which is similar to plate tectonics in geology. Two disciplines are pushed together, they move apart, or they volcanically create mountain ranges between them. And it is really important that new disciplines endlessly seem to appear from the bowels of the earth. They're created they dissipate, they erode, and they coalesce. Academia basically does not stand still. We're always looking at new ideas and new directions in order to formulate and to develop and to move agendas forward. Frankly, I'm often challenged that it's well known that academia does not now or ever has done what many in the media accuse it of doing, and that is of living in ivory towers. Academia cannot live in isolation. And just as much as the Wolf Institute, so too the University of Cambridge has as part of its mission the idea of serving society. And that idea to serve society from the university perspective is reflected in a number of directions. There's a straight physicality in my world of biomedicine of developing new drugs and making sure that those are actually made available to as many people as are require them. That's one way of serving society. But society also benefits by the thought and by the development of ideas that is exemplified both by the Wolf Institute, uh, by the university as well. And we have to contribute to that overall intellectual life of society uh, as well. So it is important that uh, we reach out to wider communities, not just internally to the community of academics that so often uh, are enshrined here in Cambridge. And that is a principle that I know the Wolf Institute also holds very dear. So the sort of work in which the Wolf Institute is engaged is of foremost importance. 
It has a mission to contribute to society. It seeks the strength and the strong ethical framework needed in public and private life. And matters of faith are important to, in the world and important here in Cambridge. And actually, we're sitting in a college which was the heart of the major <coughs> dispute in Cambridge for the best part of 20 years, as I'm told, as to whether this papist institution would actually be incorporated into Cambridge, if you'll forgive me. <laughs> <laughs> um, and, the, and the number of jokes, even enshrining Wikipedia, about destroying that papist institution is actually the role of many fellows of Cambridge. And it just shows how academia, too, evolves in terms of, of its ideas. And I'm particularly pleased that we have the Archbishop here with us today. Um, and even if I have to own up to it as a Roman Catholic, doubly so pleased that you are able to be here with us tonight. Okay. Archbishop Nichols became Archbishop of Westminster on the 21st of May 2009, following the retirement of Cardinal Cormac Murphy O'Connor, having served previously as Archbishop of Birmingham. He's a patron of the Wolf Institute, as well as of a number of Catholic charities, including the Passage and the Cardinal Hume Centre. Frankly, he's been one of the most active individuals in matters of interfaith relations. And I think we're really privileged to have him here today and to hear what he has to say on the topic that he's chosen to speak on, namely the reflections of Jewish-Christian relations today. After his address, he has kindly agreed to take questions. Um, so please store your questions up. I'm sure there will be many, because every time I have heard the Archbishop both preach and speak, I know he challenges all of us. Um, Vice Chancellor, thank you very much indeed for your words of welcome. And uh, it's a great privilege to be here. The, the topic that, or the heading that I've given to this lecture is very simply God in the city. And for those who like some signposts, it's made up of, of four sections, really. One is a reflection of the role of, of the university. The second of the city as urban living. The third is the city in terms of the financial centre and the world, world of commerce today. And then a final section on the more explicit, as it were, conscious responsiveness to the mystery of God in the midst of all of this. So as I begin this lecture, my mind turns, as Mr Kessler has already mentioned, to the morning of the 17th of September 2010, when Pope Benedict entered the Walgrave Drawing Room at St Mary's University College in Twickenham. There he met leaders, religious leaders, civic leaders, leaders in sport, industry, public service and other walks of life. What distinguished them was the fact that they were all women and men of profound religious belief, though different traditions, who brought that gift to bear onto their professional careers and achievements. And that is what made that gathering the first of its kind ever to take place in a papal visit anywhere in the world. Normally, interreligious gatherings bring together the official leaders of the various religious communities. But this was a bringing together of different kind of religious leaders, leaders in a wide range of different spheres whose belief is integral to their leadership. It was, in a way, in direct contradiction to the rather infamous remark that we do not do God. Here were people in every walk of life who do God. And this was a gathering consistent with the overall focus of the papal visit to the United Kingdom, which was to propose to our countries that faith in God is not so much a problem to be solved, but a gift to be rediscovered. Now the Holy Father recognized the character of the meeting. He said, the presence here of committed believers in various fields of social and economic life speak eloquently of the fact that the spiritual dimension of our lives is fundamental to our identity of human beings, that man, in other words, does not live by bread alone. As followers of different religious traditions working together for the good of the community at large, we attach great importance to this side-by-side -side dimension of our cooperation, which complements the face-to-face -face aspect of our continuing dialogue. These words give shape and guidance to my comments this evening, in which I would like to explore certain aspects of this working together for the good of the community at large. 
the Pope went on to say, we engage with the world wholeheartedly and enthusiastically, but always with a view to serving that higher good, God, lest we disfigure the beauty of creation by exploiting it for our selfish purposes. And secondly, at the start of these remarks, I would like to pay tribute in this same spirit to Melanie Jane Wright, in whose memory this lecture is being held. You will know, and I have learned, that Melanie was both a Cambridge and an Oxford graduate with a particular interest in the interdisciplinary study of religion and culture. From 1998 to 2007, she was academic director of the Center of the Study of Christian Jewish Relations, part now of the Wolf Institute, and was central to its development of graduate studies in these topics, not only here, but also with the Anglia Ruskin University. Just as importantly, she lived a practical commitment to improving the relationships between Jews and Christians, and as an undergraduate, was active in establishing the Cambridge University Society for Jews and Christians. She was, I am reliably told, far more concerned about what people did than what they said, knew, or professed to believe. So let her, too, be our guide this evening. It's also a pleasure to be here at St Edmunds. This college is a distinguished and constitu now constituent part of this great university. One of the qualities that it gives, especially it gives it a special place in the story of Cambridge, is its historic and vibrant connection with faith and the Catholic Church in particular, a tradition reflected especially in the contemporary work of the Research Institute of von Hugel. And many who have given great service to the Catholic Church have passed through St Edmunds, including some I've known, such as Bishop David Constant, the Bishop Emeritus in Leeds. I would first like then to focus a little on the university and look at the first dimension of the relationship between religious belief and the common good concerning education itself and the role of the university. Now this was part of the context of the state visit of Pope Benedict because of its focus on John Henry Newman, whose beatification by the Holy Father was a memorable part of those days. One of Pope Benedict's challenges to us, as he made clear in Westminster Hall, was to emphasise the unity of faith and reason and to suggest that this dynamic harmony between faith and reason, if recognised, can be a uniquely rich source for reflection and action. This truly informed rationality has been a theme that he has explored throughout his life, perhaps most strikingly in his dialogue with Jürgen Habermas. Now for the Holy Father, one of the major theatres for exploring that engagement between the life of the spirit and the life of the mind is the university. Cardinal Newman recognised the civilising role that a university could play in creating a person open to the truth in all its manifold forms, something that has resonated strongly with Pope Benedict and his predecessor, who both, of course, enjoyed careers as scholars and professors. No Newman's noble and ennobling vision was of a university in which a truly liberal education is pursued, in which, and I quote, a habit of mind is formed which lasts through life, of which the attributes are freedom, equitableness, calmness, moderation and wisdom. This, he said, is the special fruit of an education furnished at a university. That belief, allied to Newman's insight on the unity of knowledge and that its pursuit is an end in itself, remain hallmarks of an education that humanizes rather than atomizes. This approach succeeds when it is tried because it recognizes truths that develop us integrally, enlargening both intellect and soul. Contemporary universities, as you will know better than me, face many challenges 
adequate funding for access to all who would benefit, a balance between the role the government should play and the essence of a university as a self-governing society, to name only a few. <coughs> However, I would like to emphasize one fundamental aspect of the moral character of a community of learning that can be easily lost. That is, the importance of encouraging the integral development of all those, fo of all those who form part of the university, something that involves a constant struggle, not only for technical and disciplinary prowess, but also the fosterings of the virtues that any community requires in order to flourish. Virtues are habits of mind and heart by which we behave generously and correctly. Virtues are acquired by practice and the years that a person spends at a university are important years for acquiring and practice. Virtues tutor us in our use of freedom. They fashion our moral selves so that we do good even when nobody is looking. Slowly, step by step, we acquire a particular virtue until it becomes almost our normal way of acting. Only slowly do we become virtuous people. Just to expand this point a little bit, I'd like to reflect on the classical definition of virtues, something that religious traditions drawing on Greek philosophy may be held in trust for all. After all, the pursuit of them is a profoundly human quest, for these virtues in their classical definition are prudence, courage, justice and temperance. And I think they still form the practical basis of the behaviour of individuals in the service of society today. Prudence, for example, not a particularly attractive word, is simply the virtue of right reason in action. So it's the opposite of rashness or carelessness. It tempers spontaneity and enables us to discern the good in any circumstance and the right way to achieve it. So prudence is rational and intelligent, but it doesn't minimize or exclude feelings and emotions. Rather, the virtue of prudence helps us to know how to weigh the meaning and importance of our feelings so that they too become part of the decisions we take. Courage ensures a firmness and a readiness to stand by what we believe, especially in times of difficulty. So courage is the opposite of opportunism and of evasiveness, and we see plenty of those today. Courage is the practice of fortitude in the face of difficulty. So it produces heroism in every field. So courage is important in artistic creativity, for example. And it certainly helps those who battle against sickness, injustice, or simple depression. Justice, that's the virtue by which we strive to give what is due to others by respecting their rights and by fulfilling our duties to them. In this way, Justice is the virtue that expands our notion of self. Justice strengthens ties between us, especially ties with those who are most in need. And there is also, first of all, justice towards God. And that is the virtue of religion, which is fulfilled by a religious practice. And this aspect of justice frees us from the tyranny of false gods. And there are many which would claim our attention and worship. So we recall G.K. Chesterton's famous phrase, when people stop believing in God, they don't believe in nothing, they believe in anything. And the fourth virtue of this little set is that of temperance. And this is the virtue that helps to moderate our appetites and our use of the world's created goods. So temperance is the opposite of consumerism and the opposite of uninhibited pursuit of pleasure. So temperance 
is about learning to desire well. Indeed, temperance is a key part of a happy life. Now, those, that simple reflection on the virtues I offer simply because they are a key to the creation of a good society and they are well rooted in religious traditions and therefore they're key to the lives of those who sincerely wish to see their life's effort directed to the service of others. And the practice of these virtues generates trust between people. And today we can recognise that trust is in short supply. While it may be hoped that the experience of a university education may indeed be a time of the development of such virtues, a further challenge is that the university itself, as the Vice-Chancellor has already said, exists not only for its own members, but also for the broader society in which it's located. Thus, as educators, you have a testing but an immensely rich vocation to your own scholars and then to all of us whose health and well-being is linked to the serious outcomes of your teaching and research. Cardinal Newman reminded us that we are truly ourselves when we live not only for ourselves, that the human person in all his or her complexity can never be reduced to a utilitarian calculus that diminishes our true status as rational moral agents. And this can be said also to a certain extent to, of the university itself and the university's own sense of wider purpose. Permit me to illustrate this point by making an obvious remark, although I might now be about to commit a heresy. Cambridge is more than, a, than its university. It's a small city linked over the centuries to its agricultural hinterland and to its markets. Its role within the city has far wider significance than its own academic achievements. And this is something Cambridge shares with many other great cities around the world, cities graced with fine universities. I mention just those which I have known in the course of my life. Liverpool, Rome, Manchester, Chicago, Birmingham and London. Now what unites these diverse places, and I come to my second theme, is their sense of being open cities. <coughs> open to new people through migration. Open to new ideas that in turn create a rich ferment of culture and enterprise. This openness and its creativity I saw vividly in Birmingham where many ethnic and religious communities sustained a dynamic civic culture. I was not without real problems for the city but one of the mechanisms for negotiating those tensions was a partnership established between the religions, the academy and the civic leadership. One form that this partnership took was a project entitled Faiths for the City and in it Birmingham University played a key part along with the leaders of Birmingham religious traditions and its city council. The broader lesson I drew from that experience is that the potential we have when we consciously reach out to those very different to us and allow that otherness to renew our own traditions is paradoxically the best way for rediscovering the values we have in common. Let me tell you a little bit about the Faiths in the City project. It began with an academic study by scholars of the six major faiths as to what elements constitute a good city. And I would like to take a few moments just to present some of the highlights of that study, particularly those emerging from the Christian, Islamic and Jewish traditions. Each of these contributions related to the construction of a good city and it related them to the conscious awareness of God and the need to act and live in harmony with that awareness and belief. 
Indeed, it's easy to say that all <coughs> six studies, each in its own way, were united in the conviction expressed by Pope Benedict that the spiritual dimension is fundamental to what we are as human beings. The Christian Perspective was written by Dr. Toby Howarth. He explored the closeness of the relationship between God and the city. As he put it, in this faith's revelation, revelation begins in a garden and ends in a city. The Garden of Eden, in which there was harmony between people and direct intimacy with God, is lost. And the angelic guard with flashing sword <laughs> makes it clear that there's no way back. The only way is forward towards the city. And the promise is constructed as a city too. The new Jerusalem coming down out of heaven from God, in which there is no temple, since the Lord God Almighty and the Lamb were themselves the temple. And the city did not need the sun nor the moon for light, since it was lit by the raging glory of God. Words taken from the book of Revelation. In this vision, the presence of God is inseparable from the affairs of the city. For the presence of God has taken flesh in the person of Jesus, the Lamb, who even now is the light by which we are to live. Yet the fate of the Lamb executed on the cross, tells us that the city is full of ambiguity, an ambiguity from which no one is excluded. Thus, he concluded, the task of the faithful citizen is always to pray for the welfare of the city and all its people. For God, in the words of Eugene Peterson, and I quote, is not an occasional tourist to our shores. He has set up habitation here, not as a camper, but as a citizen. Now, the Jewish perspective was presented by Dr. Margaret Jacobi, <coughs> and she drew on the, sit the story of the city of Sodom and on sections of the Babylonian Talmud. She wrote this, Sodom, like most cities, is walled with gates. It is, therefore, a closed society. This means, firstly, that unlike a group in the countryside or the desert, the inhabitants of the walled city can determine who can enter it and meet its inhabitants. Secondly, it means that its inhabitants are crowded together, aware of all their neighbours' doings, for better or worse. They have a tendency to group together and exclude the other the people who come from outside the city walls. The example of Sodom, she said, is a particular warning to city dwellers. The lesson of the Talmud, she says, are clear. We learn that wealth is from God. It should not be taken for granted or lead to hubris. It does not belong exclusively to those who own it, but it is given on trust and is to be used to help the poor, the stranger, the wayfarer. The law of the wayfarer demanded that the wayfarer be cared for. It was this law that the men of Sodom abandoned. <coughs> so she wrote that in the city we learn that small actions, no matter how be they small thefts or small acts of giving, matter. We learn about justice, that while justice is to be used to protect the vulnerable, it can easily be perverted in a city, especially by the powerful. And we learn that justice can be misused even whilst abiding by the law, for a too strict an application of the law can be harmful to those whom it was designed to protect, especially the stranger and the sojourner who is not a citizen. We learn that compassion then is essential in the application of law. Neglect of these matters damages the city, since for all their arrogance and cruelty, the men of Sodom were ultimately vulnerable. 
It was the exclusion of the stranger from Sodom that created an atmosphere that was corrosive and full of fear and led <coughs> to its downfall. She concluded then, the good city is a city in which, though it may be physically enclosed, is open to the stranger and the wayfarer. It is a city which is built on justice, fairly applied but tempered by compassion. It is a city in which the poor are treated with kindness and generosity. If the inhabitants of the good city do this, they will benefit from a city which is built on trust and mutual assistance. The Islamic contribution, it's just these three, let's let give us a taste of them. The Islamic contribution was presented by Dr. Jabal Boabin. In it, not surprisingly, he presented the Islamic worldview which centered on the will, desire and the design of the one and only creator, rejects any bifurcation <coughs> of the world. Thus he made reference to that principle of Tawhid, the doctrine of the oneness of God, but insisted that in its elaboration it gives room for others to set up their own system <coughs> within the same environment because, I quote, the authoritative, objective truth that Muslims believe is upheld in Islam does not bind them to coerce people into submission. In the city, therefore, all its inhabitants enjoy comparable freedoms. And he continued, therefore, in a modern city like Birmingham, a Muslim should not have a problem helping to create a united front with all its inhabitants, those of religious faith and those who profess none, in order to build a strong, morally principled and prosperous society. Now the essential elements of these contributions are rich in their implications. An openness to the poor, the foreigner, the vulnerable. A readiness to acknowledge and make space for the variety of experiences of God and for all who wish to contribute to the common well-being. A commitment to an exploration of justice and compassion. A recognition of the importance of our spiritual dimension in an openness to our dependence of our efforts on God and a turning to God in prayer on behalf of all. The project in Birmingham was then to take these understandings of the city inspired by religious belief and apply them to the different sectors of public life, to health provision, to questions of environment, to housing and to education. But they apply to wealth creation too, which brings me to another city, the financial city, the worldwide financial market which has such a powerful centre in the city of London. Now here too, the contribution of the reflections of faith and reason together can offer crucial insights and principle for action. This in my tradition is well expressed in Catholic social teaching, a systematic reflection on the nature and purposes of industry and commerce, which has developed and matured over a hundred years now. But today, when the Financial Times <coughs> runs a series of articles called Capitalism in Crisis, and political leaders line up to give their prescriptions of how to restore responsible cap capitalism, we can be sure that something is seriously amiss. Research, too, shows a deepening level of mistrust in government and business. During the past year, the number of people expressing confidence in government and business has gone down 8% in one year. And according to the Ed Edelman Trust Barometer, just 29% of people now express that confidence. There were similar results replicated <coughs> on a global scale. That growing mistrust is a rational response to the great harm caused to many people by the irresponsibility of some in the financial sector and its associate activities. 
Great uncertainty and anxiety are the inevitable consequence of the severe economic winter we are experiencing by many. But there is perhaps also something deeper, a perception that business has somehow lost its way in a narrow pursuit of profit and personal gain. Perhaps we can see that what we lack is a shared moral framework, a shared understanding of a common purpose. Commentators on the financial crisis, <coughs> including those leading that sector themselves, have pointed out that for some, the only questions shaping behaviour are whether what is being done is legal and profitable. This may be the only residue of a lost shared morality, just as for some, the pursuit of profit has become the sole arbiter of business success. Over the last two years, there's been much discussion and debate about the need for reform of the financial sector and the need to rebuild trust. There also remains a deep ambivalence about the private sector more generally, with an enduring suspicion that the tendency of business is to exploit people rather than to serve them. So many have a deep yearning to see a more morally responsible and socially driven business model that situates business life within the wider framework of promoting the common good and the justice that entails. It is here that the contribution of Catholic social teaching, I think, has something to offer. For this teaching includes the systematic working out of what it means to place the good of the human person at the heart of the social project, <coughs> the micro level of personal and family relationships, right through to the macro level of social, economic, political relationships and structures, nationally and globally. In 2009, this tradition of teaching was refreshed in the message of Pope Benedict called Caritas in Veritate, which I think carries still an important message to help us all to think creatively <coughs> about the future. A central theme of this encyclical is to call for a profoundly new way of understanding business enterprise. While recognizing and accepting the central role of the profit motive and the commercial logic of the market, Caritas and Veritate insists that what happens in commercial and market exchanges is always to be shaped and defined by moral and cultural influences. And one quote from the document. Economic and finance are as instruments can be used badly when those at the helm are motivated by purely selfish ends. But it's not the instrument that must be called to account, but the individuals, their moral conscience, their personal and social responsibility. The economic sphere is neither ethically neutral nor inherently inhuman, as opposed to society. It is part and parcel of human activity, and precisely because it is human, it must be structured and governed in an ethical manner. Now the insistence of this teaching is the need to ensure that the human is the focus of enterprise and commerce. And this is not foreign to those in the financial sector with whom I have discussed these matters in some length. One group of senior financiers meeting in October 2009 engaged enthusiastically with the challenge of this papal document. And I was struck by some of the comments from the participants afterwards that this kind of conversation and exchange had been different in kind from those in which they could normally engage. The framework and vocabulary, even the moral language itself, gave the opportunity to them for a more rounded and human-centered discussion. In other words, their technical, professional discussions never included these dimensions. They said to me that this had helped them to reframe their own questions and to challenge their own assumptions 
about the purposes of business and about their roles as leaders. The course of these discussions illustrated how difficult it is to move from words to actions because change of performance and in particular a change in culture in the end is the acid test as is clear from the continuing and justifiable public controversy about the financial sector there is still a long way to go in issues such as the lack of effective accountability and the disconnect between performance outcomes and reward there must be real and evident change before public trust is regained. I had a conversation with one chief executive of a global company and this revealed that his priorities arrived at through business considerations were actually very similar to the priorities of Caritas in Veritate arrived at by moral considerations. He spoke for example of the vital importance of reducing inequality in society as an aim for business because that inequality so often led to political instability which in turn inhibited economic growth. Then he spoke about family stability as the key to long-term term social development and the developments of new markets. He spoke of an employee in Nigeria who spoke with pride in her extended family circle of working for this particular company. He said, that's what I need because there are the next generation of my employees and my customers. Business depends on social capital, that reservoir of trust, legality and interdependence. So from the perspective of the long-term success of his business, he was focusing on the human questions, which are also at the heart of the concern of the church and I believe of the wider religious traditions. So the question arises, how is this social capital, which we see being rapidly depleted, how can it be renewed? Is there, in fact, a way of bringing closer together concerns which thoughtful business leaders have from the perspective of the long-term success of their business with an ethical perspective which focuses on the good of the human person as the foundational goal of that same enterprise. Here, again, drawing on our religious traditions, there is a central insight in Caritas in Veritate, which I believe can be of help. It's the insistence that ethics are not a constraint on the pursuit of profit, but constitute part of the goal of the business in serving the common good. Often the question of ethics in business is addressed in terms of corporate social responsibility, doing good things on the side, or being a very major contributor to, to the revenue, the, in, the tax revenue of, of a society. But the radical challenge of the encyclical <coughs> is to propose that the core activities of business can and must themselves be ethical. This invites business leaders and society to reconceive the framework and to see profitability not as the goal of business, but rather the necessary means through which the moral purposes of business are delivered. This demands that ethical consideration should not be thought of as a constraint, but a research. In, uh, sorry, a resource. Indeed, if increasingly many business environments are no longer such a physical interaction with machinery but a meeting of minds, then productivity depends on the level of trust in that environment. And trust depends on ethical behaviour and virtuous people. Even in services where that human contact is diminished, as often in financial trading, the demands of this relational aspect of the transactions, while not absent, should nevertheless be sustained. Now the second idea which the encyclical contains in its reflections on enterprise and business is the place it gives to the idea of gift or 
in a, a rather clumsy word, gratuity. Pope Benedict says that the principle of gratuitousness and the logic of gift can and must find their place within normal economic activity. This is a human demand at the present time, but it is also demanded by economic logic. Let me illustrate that. We have got used to what I believe is a distorted and attenuated view of commercial relationships. There are those who would insist that there is no room for such gratuity in the workplace. On the contrary, they would say, when we go to work, we should leave our humanity at home. But that cannot be right. And the best firms have known that that is not right. It is our humanity that holds together self-interest and gratuity, and does so more easily when the exchange of business is not thought of as exploitative, but creatively <coughs> commercial. So it is that the satisfaction and the rewards people get from their work comes at least in part, and maybe often in a main part, from a sense of the contribution made to the lives of others by the goods and services provided. We have to recognize that the motivations of people vary and the different roles provide different scope for this kind of engagement at the human level. But the best industries, the best companies, strive to ensure that whatever job a person is doing, the dignity of the work they are doing and its contribution to the business and its overall objectives are valued and affirmed. And a second point to illustrate the importance of this gift element in economic activity is this. A business does not only provide goods and services. It also produces an environment, a culture, which <coughs> deliberately or not influences the kind of people we become. Business cultures shape and mould human attitudes and behaviour. <coughs> and we are all subtly formed by our experience at work, by the quality of interaction, how far there is real respect for people and their differences, the way in which creativity is celebrated, how often people are thanked or blamed. So this means that the vision and the mission of a business as articulated by its leaders, can and must be judged more widely than by its reference to its financial returns alone, and can indeed flourish through a recognition and an esteem of the gift quality of all that is done. Pope Benedict, through the idea of the ethical business and the logic of gift, offers us a creative way of addressing again the purpose of business, the purpose of the city, which both secures its legitimacy and highlights its core purpose to serve the common good of humanity. Now this, what I've offered, is just one example of the insights of one of the world's great religious beliefs, bringing that insight to the service of the contemporary world. Of course, if engagement with that insight and many other religious insights are to take place, then in another sense, the city cannot remain a closed city. It needs a certain openness at its centre, an openness sometimes brought about by a crisis, but more creatively by the fundamental recognition that we are not self-creating beings but essentially dependent on each other and on a transcendent dimension which lies beyond our control. So my last point. The need for this fundamental openness within the city, within each one of us, was directly addressed by Pope Benedict when he spoke in the German Parliament on the 22nd of September 2011, a year after his address here. 
In that address, he analysed the consequences of a positivist understanding of both nature and reason, in which both nature and reason are subjected entirely to the rules and limitations of science, and in which nothing beyond function is recognised as objective. He described the effect of that position, the effect of that culture, as like living in a concrete bunker in which we ourselves provide lighting and atmospheric conditions, being no longer willing to obtain either from God's wide world. A closed city indeed. But then he continued, and yet we cannot hide from ourselves the fact that even in this artificial world, we are still covertly drawing upon God's raw materials, which we refashion into our own products. So then he made his appeal. The windows have to be flung open again. We must see the wide world, the sky and the earth once more, and learn to make proper use of it. Now this quest, his quest, for an understanding of the place of the objective within our human nature and the inherent ethical demands of our human nature continued with this particular question. How can nature reassert itself in its true depth with all its demands, with all its directives? And he continued in this way. The importance of ecology is no longer disputed. We must listen to the language of nature and we must act accordingly. And then he went on, but man too has an ecology that he must respect and that he cannot manipulate at will. Man is not merely a self-creating freedom. Man does not create himself. He is intellect and will, but he is also nature. And his will is rightly ordered if he respects his nature, listens to it, and accepts himself for who he is, as one who did not create himself. In this way, and in no other, is true human freedom fulfilled. Here, in many ways, is the foundation of all that I've been trying to express this evening. In the construction of the good city, in the pursuit of true virtue, in the correct understanding of enterprise and commerce, there is a need for an openness to the other. The other might come in the person of a stranger or in dependence and trust on a trading partner. But all of these, all of these certainly help to maintain an open city. But fundamentally, the <coughs> other is the transcendent, the reality of God to whom we are radically open within the spiritual and rational dimensions of our beings. The negation of this other and of our dependence on it is leading to a reshaping of so many of our mores on which further comment could be offered. But the sense of uncertainty that is widely experienced today finds an answer, but not an easy solution in the acknowledgement of the givenness of so much of our humanity as the work of a creator who imbued it with design, beauty and with a longing for truth. Not surprisingly, in that address, Pope Benedict alluded to the one gift essential to the ruler, the one gift for which Solomon prayed. It is the gift of a listening heart so that he may govern God's people and discern between good and evil. In our public discourse, and in the part in, which, the part in it which our faiths can play, we need much more of this quality, a listening heart, listening to the deepest longings which bring us in touch with our shared human nature rather than our individuality, in touch with the spiritual realm rather than just the positivism of logic and science, into touch with the wisdom which is God the Creator Spirit. This makes of our nature not just an is, 
but also an ought. Not just an experience, but also a command, which in the tumult of our emotions and efforts, we may find difficult to discern and obey. The fashioning of a listening heart is a crucial part of our desire to serve society, and one to which each of the great religious traditions can make such a significant contribution. Without a doubt, one of the significant features of our time is the profound desire to foster and benefit from genuine dialogue between our religious beliefs and traditions. This desire is shaped not only by the evident need for our society to find sound ethical basis on which to build, not only the, in the need to generate in society those values which lead to generous, selfless service, but also out of the religious conviction that the one eternal God graces our world in many different ways. It is in response to that graciousness, that gratuity, that we, in our turn, offer to each other a warmth and a respect which motivates us to explore together, to study together, and together to serve the cause of our human flourishing. In this work, the Wolf Institute has rightly won wide admiration and regard and may continue this good work for many years to come. And I thank you for your attention. Thank you.